Hello, I'm Larry Richards, a Greek teacher for nearly 50 years and also the author of Read Greek in 30 Days or Less. In this short PowerPoint file, I'm going to demonstrate a revolutionary way to learn Greek, a system of learning Greek that I think you will find almost too good to be true. What you will see in this YouTube, uh, YouTube presentation is how the core of beginning Greek grammar can be captured on one page. That's right, one page. I know that sounds wild. It sounds impossible. In fact, I've heard people say that many times. So I am rewarded when students see that it can indeed be done. The file that I'm going to be sharing with you is actually a summary of this book, uh, Read Greek in 30 Days or Less, and is a PowerPoint presentation that I give to beginning Greek students toward the end of the term to, as a reminder of how simple uh, Greek grammar actually is. In fact, about uh, eight years ago, I was uh, toward the end of a course, I mentioned to the class that I could put uh, uh, basic Greek grammar on the board in less than 10 minutes, and a Korean, a Korean student said, sir, that's impossible. Well, I wasn't going to let that challenge go by, so I went up and did it. And I've done it uh, every year at the end of the term. And uh, students, when students started taking pictures of it with their iPhone, I decided to create this file that I'm going to be sharing with you, the core of Greek grammar on one page. You're going to see in just a few moments that this is done by showing how much of the grammar is interrelated, immensely reducing the amount of memorization. My textbook on beginning Greek bases the core of Greek grammar on what I call eight minimums. So let me tell you what I mean by the term minimum. A minimum captures a ton of information. Let me give you an example. Minimum number one are the endings of a Greek adjective. It can be any adjective, but I need an adjective because I need to show the form in all three genders, which is needed for the minimum. These adjective endings for one word in the minimum are the same endings for 43 additional forms. And unfortunately, all 43 of these additional forms are given separately in conventional grammars with no indication to the student that the endings of the form are already known. In other words, I show that a minimum provides an incredible amount of information, meaning that once the student knows the minimum, the student has learned automatically dozens of forms given separately in other grammars. Now, I need you to keep in mind that, of course, because I'm trying to do this on one page, I do not have labels like the case uh, identification, gen uh, nominative, genitive, dative, and so forth. I don't have tense, mode, and voice, and that sort of thing. So I'm assuming that the student knows what is meant by declension or conjugation. But let me say this, even if you don't, I think you'll still be able to capture the, the strength of this particular approach. So let's move on now then to the file. And let me show you, first of all, uh, what um, I'm going to do with the minimums. Uh, mentioning here that Breakthrough Books is spelled, uh, find it here, Breakthrough is just T-H-R-U, BreakthroughBooks.com. I'll give that information to you again. The eight minimums I'm listing here, first of all, before we actually see them on one page. Minimum one are the endings of the first and second declensions. Two, the endings of the third declension. Then minimum three are the four basic verb endings in the indicative mode. Four and five, which are really the heart of my method, the tense identifiers and their application then the participle and the other two modes in minimum seven, and then on a separate page, that very difficult and complex uh, me verb. What I've done here now 
because I'm going to show you the core beginning group right here on this page. But I have put up here at the top those minimums, like minimum one, the first and second declensions, and so forth, so that you can consult them because they will not be labeled in the uh, except by number as we go through the presentation. So you see right here, that one right there corresponds to that one right there. So we're looking here at minimum one, the endings of the first and second declension. Now, I want you to notice that one of the first things I have done is, that makes the learning of Greek much more logical is that I have taken the neuter gender out of the third column, which all other books, uh, all other books place it there, and I have moved it over to the second column, which is a logical sequence. Why? Because the neuter and the masculine belong to the same declension. And you'll notice that I've only given two forms for the neuter gender. And the reason for that is very simple. In all neuter words, the nominative singular is the same in the accusative singular. And the nominative plural is the same in the accusative plural. And then the genitive and the dative, both singular and plural, are repeated. They are, so everything else is copied. You could not show that if you had the neuter gender separated by the feminine gender. In minimum number two, the endings of the third declension, you'll notice that the masculine and feminine endings are identical. So you know whether it's masculine or feminine, either by definition or by the definite article that may precede it. Notice, too, that there are two possible endings in the nominative singular, a sigma or none, and the same for the accusative singular, an alpha or a noon. It'll be one or the other. Words do not interchange. If it ends with a sigma, it will always end with a sigma. And once again, notice that the neuter gender is going to have the same setup that we saw in the second declension. And also notice that the alpha in the neuter plural is the same as the alpha in the second declension. These two minimums take care of the declension of every noun, pronoun, adjective, and participle in all three genders in the New Testament. Five forms. One, two, three, four, five. You can have five or you can have 70 or 80. You make your choice. This next minimum is the hardest minimum. Over here, number three are the four basic verb forms. And you'll notice that I have here in the middle a, a now heading with a bold blue line. Everything to the left of that represents the past tenses. The imperfect tense is used as a model because we're going to build all past tenses in the indicative mode on the imperfect. And then to the right of now are the present tense endings. Column one is active, column two is middle and passive, and then that's the same thing for the present tense. Because these are all past tenses, there is an epsilon in the front of the verb stem, an epsilon augment. And I tell students to be reminded of the fact that E stands for earlier, earlier than now. When I teach uh, uh, Greek in the summer as an intensive, beginning Greek in 12 days, I have students learn this as one assignment. When I do it during an ordinary semester, I split those two, the left column on one day and the right-hand columns on another day. Now, minimum four and five is such a lifesaver. Let me tell you what we've got going here. This is the tense identifier for the future active and middle. This is the tense identifier for the future passive. And the line here will become, the purpose for showing that will become clear in just a moment. All of these tense identifiers down here are for the past tenses. So sigma alpha is a tense identifier for the aorist active and middle. The aorist passive is theta eta. 
kappa alpha is the perfect active, and the omission of a connecting vowel is the tense identifier for the perfect middle and passive. Now, what do you do with these? Well, minimum five tells you. I actually hit two there. Well, let me, you got more information on there than I've covered, but let me go back and get them. Uh, here you have a sigma it, it, as a tense identifier. What are you going to do with it? You insert it in front of these endings, right in front. So this would be sigma omega, sigma, 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 right down the front. And you've got your future active. Then you want, because it's also the tense identifier for the future middle, you simply put a sigma right down there and you've got your future middle. For the aorist passive, I mean for the future passive, you have the tense identifier is, is theta eta sigma, you put a theta eta sigma right in front. So it's just in, insert the tense identifier in front of the present endings. It's that simple. Now when it comes to the past tenses, the tense identifier, sigma alpha, is going to replace the connecting vowel. The connecting vowel is always the first vowel in the ending. It'll always be an omicron or an epsilon. And so let's do one. Let's take, uh, we want to do the aorist active, which is sigma alpha, and let's go to the first person plural. It says replace the connecting vowel. So we're going to kick that omicron out and put a sigma alpha in there. So instead of amen, it'll be salmen. Let's do the aorist passive. Aorist passive, strangely enough, is always built on the active model, not the passive. But the aorist passive has a theta eta there. So instead of amen, it would be themen. Perfect tense would be common. And for the, the uh, uh, perfect middle and passive, we'll go over here. Instead of amatha, it'd just be metha, because the connecting vowel would disappear. Now, when we come to minimum six, uh, you'll see up here that minimum six is divided into the active voice, as along with the aorist passive, and then the middle passive. To form the uh, active participle, you simply put O-N-T in front of your minimum two endings, the third declension, O-N-T. That's true for the masculine, and that's true for the neuter. Notice I have blanked out the F for feminine up here because the feminine is going to put O-U-S in front of first declension endings. And that takes care of your active participle and aorist passive. Now, when you come to 6b, the middle passive participle, we go back to minimum number one, right here, first and second declensions, and we put men in front of all the endings. This is probably the easiest minimum in the entire uh, New Testament to recognize because nothing changes from this menos, menon, mene, nothing changes. The only thing that changes is what is in front of the men, and that's going to be the tense identifier. I'll come back to that in just a moment. But let's go to minimum seven. Minimum seven, as you'll notice up here, is going to be divided by the, sub the subjunctive and the imperative. The subjunctive is very simple also because it is going to be based on the primary endings, the active and middle passive of the present tense. And all you do is lengthen the connecting vowel. The connecting vowel, well, omega is as long as it can get. So we're going to lengthen that epsilon to an eta and subscript the iota. Make that an eta and subscript the iota. Omega, eta, and the diphthong becomes osi. And they do the same thing for the middle and passive over here. And uh, I'm coming back in just a moment to show you what you do with the other tenses because the, the, the uh, uh, subjunctive and the imperative occur only in two tenses, the present and the aorist, because you want to show either ongoing action or the beginning action of action or point action. For the imperative, I have just to and toson. Uh, in Greek, they have a third person singular and a third person uh, plural for the imperative, whereas in English, we only have second singular and second plural. And uh, let me just say now something about this last point right here. Minimums four and five, right here, the tense identifiers and what to do with the tense identifiers, apply to 
the basic four verb endings and to also the participle, active, middle, and passive, and also to the subjunctive and the imperative. Now let me demonstrate, I'll start right here. In the Greek, the present imperative will be eto. If it's an aorist, we're going to substitute the sigma alpha for that, so it'll be sato. Or the aorist passive would be theto. And let's go to the subjunctive. The tense identifier is for the aorist passive, which is built on the active, is an abbreviated tense identifier. It's just a theta instead of a theta eta. We're going to put a theta right there, all the way down in front of the lengthened vowel. And likewise, for the aorist, we're going to have an abbreviated tense identifier. It's just going to be a sigma. So a sigma would go right down there. So you really only have five forms, and the endings are all identical. If you come over here, let's look uh, over here at the uh, uh, middle passive participle. The omicron would go there, ominos, ominu, omino, ominon, and so forth, and a sigma in front of it for the future middle. And then, if this was going to be aorist middle, we'd put a sigma alpha there instead of the omicron. Over here, for the this, we'd say, for example, let's turn this, let's do uh, antos. Put O and T in front of the genitive. Antos, it would be santos for the aorist, or thintos for the aorist passive. So uh, this information right here is going to be used over and over again and makes everything so much more simple. Now let's go to the me verb. The me verb is a verb that has bothered students from who knows how long. And it even bothers some teachers, and some skip over it. Let me show you how to make the me verb very, very simple. And here it is. I have four points. Three of them are here in this presentation. If you have an iota in front of the stem, and that stem can be either long or short with its vowel, do or da, for example, in didomi, means the sense has to, tense has to be present or imperfect. If it is imperfect, it's going to have an augment. So that's the key right there. Do you have an iota in front of the stem? And because if there is no iota in front of the stem, the, you're going to follow the conjugation that you have already been used to, the omega conjugation, like in luo. Then one other point here. The aorist often uses kappa alpha instead of sigma alpha. Well, the kappa alpha is a tense identifier for the perfect tense. So if the aorist and the perfect have the same kappa alpha, how do you tell the difference? Well, let's look here at uh, didomi. First of all, there is your long stem. Instead of omicron there, you've got a long. So it's going to be either do or da. And here it's do. Now, you'll notice that there is our iota. So that means we're dealing with the present tense. There's no augment. All right, now here's what happens then when we go, we're going to go back up here now and use the omega conjugation. And there it is. There's your do. There's your stem. stem. Just a minute here. There's your stem. There's your augment. And there's your tense identifier. But here is the perfect. So we have etica, dedica. That's the way you tell the difference. And notice also then here for tithomy, you there's your iota right there, telling you that's a present tense. And there's your uh, ethica and then tethica for the perfect tense. So you can really avoid uh, confusing them uh, if you just look for the other marks of an aorist tense, I mean a perfect tense. So read Greek in 30 days or less. That is available at www.breakthroughbooks.com or through Logos Bible software. If you have that, you can get an electronic copy. If you buy the book and have questions, you're welcome to contact me at my e email address, larry500 at aol.com. And uh, you might want to know bookstores get 40% discount if it's used as a textbook. And for those of you, the teachers who uh, use my book, uh, have access to my slides. 
Well, that's the end of this uh, presentation, and I hope that you'll be encouraged to study Greek and do it with more confidence and enthusiasm. Thank you.